Some people, they're seeking to create a new job, a new career, or maybe a new relationship. Others are hungry for a mystical experience, yearning to understand life from a fresh perspective. And what I've come to realize is this. Science has become the language of mysticism. It's science that takes the mystery out of the mystical and points to possibilities. Science gives us a common ground, a way to create community where we gather for all kinds of reasons. But ultimately, what people truly crave is wholeness. You see, whenever we want something, we are acknowledging separation. We're living in lack. But when we began experimenting with scientific measurements, we started noticing something incredible. When a person taps into something greater than themselves, it begins to influence their nervous system. It's in learning this skill of self-regulation, of aligning with this greater wholeness, that we unlock a new potential. If you create from that space of wholeness instead of from separation, the effects on your reality are profound. There's no longer any division between cause and effect. Your thoughts begin to immediately manifest as experiences. And what exists between cause and effect is time. So why not practice collapsing time? Why not shorten the interval between thought and experience? Because when you begin to see things showing up in your life, when you're creating in real time, you become more kind, more loving, more aware. You become more present because you feel more whole. My mission is to teach people the formula, the formula for healing, for creating reality, for stepping into other dimensions of possibility. And they can do this without needing anything external. You see, we all have these dormant systems within the brain, just waiting to be activated. Once they're switched on, you realize you're not a linear being living a linear life. You're a dimensional being living a dimensional life. It only takes one transformative experience for you to never be the same again. When you transcend your focus on your body, on people and things, on time and place, when you stop anticipating the next moment or reliving the past, you begin to enter a whole new realm. You start passing through the eye of the needle where you connect with this invisible unifying field of energy that binds everything together. And in this space, you can't rely on your senses. There are different rules here. No place to go, just pure creation. Every thought carries a frequency. And when you start creating from that place of one oneness, you're truly living your purpose. I give people many opportunities to get beyond themselves, to get frustrated, to get stuck in their own analytical thinking, because that's when they hit the edge of their old beliefs. And finally, when they decide to let go and surrender to the experience, something shifts. They encounter that feeling, that transcendent moment, and suddenly everything changes. They don't care about material things anymore. They want that feeling. They want that connection. And when they come back from that inner experience, their perception of reality is expanded. They're seeing things they couldn't see before, not because the environment changed, but because their inner world shifted. That transcendental moment, that burst of joy, bliss, ecstasy, it changes you. You can't go back to who you were before. The illusion of limitation dissolves, and all you want is to embrace the unknown. As you continue to close the gap between cause and effect, thought and experience, you move closer to the divine. When that happens, all those things you thought you wanted, they fall away. The real joy comes from the process of overcoming, of becoming who you truly are, and no one can take that from you. What I've discovered is this. When you can explain it clearly, when there's no room for superstition or dogma, people get it. Once they understand the what and the why, the how becomes so much easier. I teach concepts and ideas, blending different branches of science to create a cohesive model of understanding. And when people share that model with each other, they start rewiring their brains, creating new neural networks. If they can align their behaviors with their intentions and have a new experience, their brain releases chemicals that produce feelings and those feelings shift their reality. When you feel unlimited, worthy, and deeply in love with life, everything changes. And when you reach that place where you're so whole, so complete, that you no longer care about what others think, you've found freedom. You're no longer driven by external validation. You're happy just being you. And that's the kind of freedom that transforms lives. Now, how much more could we achieve if we realized that time and space are just illusions, that the past and future are happening now? It only takes one moment of re-entering that timeless space and you can never see the world the same way again. People often find that when they gather knowledge and new information, they become aware of what they were once unconscious of. And that shift in awareness 
it brings possibilities, it fills you with light, with energy, and suddenly you're seeing opportunities that were invisible to you before. That's what this work is all about, awakening to your fullest potential and living from a place of wholeness. Getting beyond the analytical mind, that's one of the main reasons we meditate. The analytical mind is wired to predict, to control, to figure out what's coming next. It's obsessed with trying to make sense of the unknown, but here's the thing, it often talks us out of possibility. It keeps us trapped in the known, in the familiar, because it's afraid of stepping into the unknown. We have this belief, deeply ingrained, that if we lead with too much passion, if we let our heart guide us, we'll somehow lose control lose our life. But if I'm working on overcoming my fear and you're working on transcending your frustration and we both drop into that heart space, now we're connected. We're like-minded. Not because we're thinking the same thoughts, but because we're connected through that invisible field, that unified energy. So do you need the sugar pill? Do you need the saline injection or a placebo surgery to feel better? No, because what those things are really doing is marrying a clear intention with an elevated emotion. When you start feeling optimism, possibility, inspiration, you're changing your state of being. And when people believe they're receiving the real thing, their bodies respond. They feel better, not because of the pill, but because they've shifted their inner state. Now imagine doing that without any external substance. Just by focusing your mind and elevating your emotion, you start to feel good, maybe for the first time in a long time. And if you practice feeling good every day for eight weeks, guess what? You're going to start feeling good, period. It's a natural side effect. When I gather a thousand people in a room, by the middle of the event, everyone is in their heart. They've learned how to access that energy. And when I ask them to focus that energy on a thought, maybe to wish healing for someone or to envision their dream life, the entire room moves as one mind, one heart. The collective energy begins to uplift those who might be struggling. Not because it's about individual dreams, but because helping others is now the priority. And this is what happens. A man shows up at one of these events in a wheelchair, completely paralyzed from a stroke. His daughter pushes him around for days. Then on the final day, he has a profound experience. He returns home and he's able to walk. That's the power of collective energy, of heart-centered focus. You contribute to the greater whole, and in doing so, you change lives. You make a difference. This is why we do the work, for that feeling of connection, of impact. When you keep showing up, when you keep opening your heart for someone else, you begin to sense that energy. It's always there, and the more you tune in, the more you feel it. That's what it's all about. I want people to not just learn this, but to execute it to use the tools to create the life they desire. As they get closer to the source, to that singularity of wholeness, it's no longer about me. It becomes about us, about community. And that's when we start to emerge as something greater. People often ask me, how do I create the relationship of my dreams? And I tell them, take out a piece of paper and write down everything you want in that person. Now become that person. So many people have distorted definitions of love. Some think it's about need, others about control or dominance, but those experiences don't lead to true love. If you want a loving relationship, ask yourself, would you date you? That's the real question. And here's the truth, I don't believe in working on a relationship. If you're working at it, something isn't aligned. Instead, both people need to bring their best selves and celebrate life together. When that happens, there's growth, there's synergy, energy multiplies. If things aren't clicking, it's important to ask yourself, what am I missing? Where am I not seeing myself clearly? People say they want love, but what they really want is happiness. And that happiness starts within. That's why we do meditations to create love in all aspects of life, not just romantic relationships, but with family, friends, and even yourself. In the quantum field, thoughts are the electrical charge and feelings are the magnetic charge. What you think sends the signal out and what you feel draws the experience back to you. So if you're living in fear, anger, or frustration, there's no magnetic field to attract love. In fact, if you're blaming someone else or a situation for how you feel, then that person or situation is controlling you. You're a victim to it. Most people are unconsciously reacting to their environment, letting the hormones of stress dictate their emotions. And those survival emotions, fear, anger, judgment, make us feel separate from our dreams. They keep us locked in the known, in the past. But when you're in survival mode, 
you're actually weakening your body, making it more vulnerable to stress and even illness. If you truly want a relationship based on love, you have to practice trading those survival emotions for elevated emotions. You have to practice opening your heart. It's a skill. And like any skill, it takes time and repetition. But once you master it, you're no longer in survival. You're in creation. And that's when life begins to change. People often tell me, I can't open my heart. I just can't feel love. And I always respond, well, what have you been practicing feeling? Right? Because the truth is, whatever you practice feeling, you end up feeling most of the time. That feeling might be guilt, but it's become so familiar that you don't even recognize it as guilt anymore. It just feels like you. Most people spend their lives reacting to how they feel or just recycling familiar emotions based on their environment. If they have a negative thought, they feel bad. A judgmental thought triggers chemicals that make them feel divided. And the stronger the emotion we feel about something external, be it a problem, situation, or person, the more we focus on it. It's like an alarm that narrows our attention to the cause. The brain, in response, takes a mental snapshot, creating a lasting memory tied to that experience. Now here's the kicker. Every time you think about that event, your brain produces the same chemical response as if it's happening all over again. The body being so objective doesn't know the difference between the actual event and the emotion you're generating by thought alone. You're conditioning your body to live in the past. Your memory isn't just in your brain anymore. It's been hardwired into your body. Over time, this becomes a subconscious program. Resentment, fear, anger, they're not conscious choices anymore. They've become emotional habits locked in your body's chemistry. So when I tell people, open your heart, they often say, no way, I was hurt before. I need to see your cards first. But living in that state of survival, driven by stress hormones, is slowly making you sick. You can't live in fight or flight mode forever without serious consequences. You're teaching your body, by thought alone, to create illness. And because you're stuck in this emotional loop of the past, stepping into the unknown feels impossible. People say, I can't feel joy, I can't feel love. What they're really saying is that they've conditioned their body so much to emotions of the past that they can't imagine feeling anything different. Anger, fear, these are altered states caused by survival chemicals that throw your brain and body out of balance. If you keep living in that space, imbalance becomes your new normal. Now, let's get back to love. You might intellectually know what you want in a partner. You've got your checklist, she's got to look like this, he's got to act like that. But if you don't feel the emotion of that future, if you're waiting for someone or something to change so you can feel love, then you're operating on cause and effect. You're saying, once it happens, then I'll feel it. But the truth is, you're holding your relationship at a distance because you lack the magnetic energy to draw it toward you. So the question becomes, can you teach your body to feel love before it even shows up in your life? Can you reverse engineer the process and feel the emotion of that loving relationship before it manifests? That means you can't wait for the external world to change first. You have to feel love now. It's about getting so present that you're not trying to predict the future or rehashing the past. You see, most of our thoughts and feelings are shaped by our past experiences. Your brain is essentially a record of everything you've experienced up until this moment. It's a map of the known. When something significant happens to you, all of your senses take in information from your environment. This data floods your brain, organizing neurons into new patterns based on that experience. Your brain then releases a chemical, an emotion, and that's how you create a memory. Powerful emotional events stick with us because they stamp neural patterns into our brain. You remember September 11th, right? You know where you were, what time it was, who you were with, because the emotional charge of that day made your brain wake up and pay attention. That memory became hardwired into your neural circuitry. So if your thoughts and feelings are rooted in your past, how do you break free? Well, thoughts and feelings, when repeated enough, create attitudes. Positive thoughts linked to positive emotions give you a good attitude. Negative thoughts and feelings lead to a bad attitude. When you string enough attitudes together, you form beliefs. And a belief is simply a thought you've repeated so many times that it's become a subconscious program. Most beliefs are based on past experiences, so the boundaries of those beliefs are defined by how you feel. That's why challenging beliefs can feel uncomfortable. It's a disruption of what's familiar. In today's world, we're at a turning point. Some people are clinging to outdated paradigms while others are waking up, realizing they have more control than they thought. 
We used to believe that the brain couldn't change, that neuroplasticity was impossible. Why? Because researchers were studying animals in environments that never changed. If there's no new experience, how can there be new neural connections? But now, in the information age, ignorance is a choice. People are stepping outside of convention. They're asking deeper questions, looking beyond old beliefs. And when you start to see your reality differently, you create new possibilities. You start to change your brain, your chemistry, and your life. When you step outside the conventions of what people consider normal, there's often a moment when the world labels you as reckless, even crazy. But the moment you produce a result, the same people will call you a genius, a mystic, or even a saint. The point is, daring to be original always pushes you into a space where you're judged until the results speak for themselves. And that's the space I want to explore, this divide between the old paradigms and the new understandings. That's why I'm so committed to measuring the changes in people. When someone overcomes a traumatic injury or heals from a chronic condition by thought alone, I don't just want them to say, I feel better. I want the data to back it up. I want to show that their brain and body are objectively better. They didn't rely on drugs or external interventions. They rewired their biology with pure thought and the measurements are there to prove it. So yes, we're living in a time where the camp is divided. There are those who are stuck in the old paradigms and those stepping into the new ones. And bridging that gap, that's where we come in. The thing is though, change doesn't just happen because you want it to. You have to be skilled at this. You have to learn how to regulate your mind and body, how to get beyond the thoughts that say, I can't, or this will never happen. Now imagine 500 people gathered at an event, all working to cross that river, to move from their unconscious habits, their negative thoughts, the stories they tell themselves, stories like, I'm too old, or this is just who I am. And they've been stuck in these emotional states, whether it's guilt, unworthiness, fear, for so long, they don't even know they're there. It just feels like me. But as they become aware of these patterns, they start to break free and we see breakthroughs, measurable breakthroughs. One by one, you start to see people transform. And the changes, they're infectious. Just like a disease can spread through a community, wellness can too. The science supports this. If a small group of people breaks free from the conditioning of their past, they create a ripple effect of health and transformation in their environment. That's why we measure. But those measurements are only as good as the people willing to do the work. You see, most people live trapped within the limits of their analytical minds. The conscious mind, separated from the subconscious, keeps them stuck in their old patterns. And unless you transcend that analytical mind, you'll keep recreating the same reality. That's the difference between thinking within your beliefs, those emotional limiting states, and stepping beyond them. When you break through, you tap into your autonomic nervous system, and that's where real biological change occurs. If we can teach people how to sustain that, if they practice enough and immerse themselves in an environment that encourages change, then the transformation becomes undeniable. And that's where the real shift happens, when people realize they're not powerless. They don't need external solutions. They can create the change from within. Think about it. Attitudes are just condensed states of being. String a few attitudes together and you form beliefs. Beliefs in turn create our perceptions, but most of these beliefs aren't even conscious. They're subconscious programs from past experiences. So without even realizing it, we're seeing our lives through the lens of our past and we're filling in the present moment with the memory of yesterday. This was proven in an experiment where people wore glasses that showed two different colors on either side. After a couple of weeks, they stopped seeing the colors altogether. Their brains had filled in the blanks based on their past perceptions. They weren't truly seeing reality. They were seeing their brain's memory of it. And that's what we do in our lives. We overlay our present with the past, limiting the possibilities of our future. But when you understand that, when you become conscious of it, that's when the real transformation begins. You break the cycle of seeing life through the lens of what was and start creating a new reality of what can be.